Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. It was the first days of June 2002. There was a strong heat in the city. So many children seemed to be a yard on their own age yet unknown. Everywhere were running, jumping and shouting, and with precise voices of kids of all different ages, somewhere in the garage, and stood guys, teenagers, discussing the failed Los Angeles Lakers game. What had been shown on first the day before. On the playground there were loudly frolicking kids about five five seven years old. Behind them walked an older girl with a business-like look, constantly interfering in their children's games, so that they do not hurt each other. On the benches sat a company of guys by the look of middle school students, playing family, throwing to each other a red rubber ball. A homeless man shouted, one of the guys sharply threw the ball to his friend. There was general laughter. The children were so loud that the grandmothers of the neighboring benches all this cacophony began to annoy. Get out of here, you fools. Aunt Wendy got up from the bench and approached the boys. What can't you see? There are small children playing here. The boys didn't calm down. They laughed at Tony, who had managed to marry an alcoholic and become homeless. Of course, it was all just play-by-play, -play, but still so funny that the boys laughed at the firewood and their bellies, ignoring the indignant look on Aunt Wendy's face. Come on, Aunt Wendy. We're out of here, said Thomas, the rowdiest boy in the yard. Let's go. But what kind of words are you talking about? I'm gonna talk to my mom so I'm gonna talk loud again." Thomas shouted after her. They're already leaving with their friends towards the garages. The noisy company left the yard. They were once again chased away for swear words and loud shouting by Wendy, the storm of the yard and the head of the house. What are we gonna do? Guys, Thomas asked the boys. Let's go to the stone field, said Will. Well, we'll decide on the way, answered Thomas. The boys went and hung around the neighborhood in search of entertainment, which of course they arranged for themselves. But whatever they did on those hot summer days, they were the happiest kids in the world. After all, it was vacation, which meant it was freedom. The summer sky was slowly changing, just as it was getting darker and darker. And yet, even at 8 o'clock plus in the evening, it was still quite bright. Not even 200 hours ago, the courtyard was full of children, Hence the noise, the shouting, and the life. Now there were only two women, one of whom was Wendy, and two girls about eight years old. They often stayed out late. The girls could sometimes go home at 11 o'clock p.m. And their names were Kate and Daria. They became friends, as if, somewhere in their subconscious, they felt they had a similar misfortune, a misfortune. That was dysfunction. The girls grew up in families with parents, alcoholics, who almost did not work, and without bread to water at the expense of handouts from the state, and money on loan from relatives and buddies of drinking buddies. And if Kate and parents were quiet and phlegmatic, and drunkards, then Dad and Mom Daria knew the whole yard. They loved to organize scandals in the yard so that everyone could hear their profanity. It was quite a spectacle for the neighbors. Most of them looked out of their windows and balconies in a civilized manner. Well, rare people tried to take away the grief of the spouses. One such brave woman was Wendy. She considered it a necessity to observe the situation in the place where children walked and adults rested. Often she had to contend with identified alcoholics. In the middle of the night, who decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with their friends, she also dealt with suspicious teenagers who came to lounge on the benches. And she was the one who kicked out the screamers and scandalizers disturbing people's sleep the night before another workday. She was grateful, of course, but at the same time few people even tried to help Wendy. Wendy loved would discuss with the neighbors these two girls lonely away from other children and playing in the yard until late at night. This fact disliked and frightened her, but she didn't know how to help the little ones or what to do with them. What if a maniac showed up here? She looked at Kate and Daria on the swings sharing her worries with her neighbor Lucy from the second entrance. Lucy was indifferent to the late-night outings of other neighbors' children. Indifferent where? Oh, come on. It's not like you're posting. Exhaling smoke from a cigarette, grinned Lucy. Oh, enough of me for all the manky. There are little girls hanging around, 
with their clothes and holes all over the place. She was indignant. Look at the ballerinas. Look at Jacob. When was the last time they were sober? Wendy took a deep puff and looked at the card with a sad smile. Beautiful girl, so kind, so good. How could she be? Well, why do you look at these faces? Such to be certainly will not want to be, answered Lucy. It's time for bed, said Wendy. As usual, she went to the girls and asked them if it was time to go home. The kind-hearted woman realized that chasing the girls home to their inebriated and therefore inadequate parents was not the right thing to do. But it was at the same time the least evil of the two options available to them at the moment. Either Kate and Daria waited until it was so deep into the night, when their parents would normally be asleep, but risked running into dangerous people on the street. Or they come early and run into drunken profanity at best, but were still relatively safe. Such alternatives for little innocent creatures, upsetting Wendy almost every day, but there wasn't much more she could do for them. The next day, the yard was again full of workers. In it as on a large theater stage were lined up the usual mise-en-scene for those who liked to look out the window. Grandmothers were still sitting on the bench, teenagers were gathering near the garages, and on the playground small noisy children were playing. Even this noise had long been familiar to those around them. Another unpleasant incident disrupted all this order. It was not uncommon here. Maria ran into the yard, a girl of about 12 from a dysfunctional family. She was followed with heavy steps by a large, red-haired, short-cropped woman of about 50 years old. She was clearly angry, her cheeks red with anger and her eyes bulging. Said it all about her emotional state. These sounds, remotely resembling words, came out of her mouth and traveled all over the yard. A deep mute lived nearby. Her name was Molly. She was often teased by the local boys, and some of them threw stones at her. That day she had a problem with Maria. For the girl immediately interceded local grandmothers, trying to stop angry Molly, 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 Molly. But at the counter, the older women lashed out at the deaf mute. She first waved away, pushed their hands away, but then, saying something incomprehensible, sat down on a bench and calmed down. She took a breath. Still the grandmothers came closer to her. They saw Molly crying quietly. Come on, scratch the rivers. One of the old ladies came running in deaf and dumb. Molly sat on the bench for a while, as if thinking about something, took her dark blue cloth and her bag, which was almost empty. She took her dark blue and rag bag, which was almost empty, and went on her way. Girlfriends Kate and Daria watched this picture with horror. They then discussed Molly and Maria for a long time. What could she have so offended the poor invalid woman? The girls, like the grandmothers on the bench, were hardy creatures. They never liked it when the weak and unlikable were offended. And now they took pity on poor Molly, calling Maria a fool. The sun was shining brighter than usual. There were still many children, grandmothers and adults on the streets, already having fun, singing alcoholic beverages, and not at all embarrassed by the large number of underage visitors to the palace. She could see the people of the playground and beyond from bottom to top. The girl was hanging from one of the yard turnstiles. It was one of her favorite things to do. Everything flipped upside down, giggling, she told her friend. Her blue t-shirt came down and distressed her small baby belly. You can see the belly button, Daria laughed, Mary on the turnbuckle. Kate was embarrassed and timidly took hold of the edges of the t-shirt and pulled it back up. Two little innocent angels were so carelessly playing and chatting about all sorts of silly things on the playground. And everyone had stopped their eyes on them at least once. They were cute. And at the same time in the eyes of these two beautiful creatures was already a lot of pain. And even a lot for eight-year-old girls. It was getting colder outside. A strong wind was falling. In a matter of minutes, the courtyard became completely quiet. Almost everyone had gone home. Thunder rumbled in the distance. On the bench sat a woman about 50 years old with bags, probably found them from the store and sat down to rest. Daria and Kate were running around the yard, oblivious to the overcast weather and signs of an impending thunderstorm. The stranger on the bench was smiling, having watched the kids run around. The wind blew even harder. The sand soared into the sky. 
The girls squealed oh, sand in the eye straight shrieked. Hate, I'm going home, replied her friend. She quickly ran towards her driveway, looking around. Hate noticed only now. There wasn't a soul in the yard. This had happened before. So the girl said to herself, well, here I am again alone here, the only one she noticed was some strange lady with bags. The girl decided to approach her. Hello, do you need help carrying? She asked the woman. Oh, I can manage my dear. What's your name? Answered the stranger Kate. I'm Miranda. Where do you live? I asked the children not far away. I was passing by your yard. Why aren't you home? Kate, look at the weather. The woman surprisingly quickly picked up the conversation with a strange child, while well, with interest, looking at her clothes, hands, facial features, the expression of her face from gloomy became smiling and interested. The girl was embarrassed. She was always trying to make conversation so that it didn't descend into uncomfortable questions. Parents, and now, when asked about her reason for not wanting to go home, Kate sadly thought of making something up again. She had been silent for a long time. And Miranda, noticing this childish, innocent embarrassment, replied, Why don't you go home? There's a big hurricane coming anyway. Look, the sand has already risen into the sky. I'm not afraid. A few years ago, when I was, like, four, I was alone on the street, and it started. Well, then they took me away, but I almost flew away. The girl talked animatedly about the events of that terrible storm. Well, I immediately saw that you are a brave girl. Now run, Miranda replied. Her face broke into a smile of delight. Okay, Kate replied cheerfully. She walked slowly towards her house. The wind was still blowing. After a few more minutes, it started pouring rain in the city. Kate's parents, Anna and Jacob, were total scandalous alcoholics. The family was on the books as a dysfunctional family, and everyone knew their situation. The father and mother were quite young, and I was 40 years old and Jacob was 42. In addition to Kate, there was a boy named Tim. Where was he? During the summer vacations, nobody knew his 14 years, or rather knew, but only the same no nobody needed wandering in the yards of his friends' teenagers. They would run around the garages, play soccer, and drink beer. Questioning the local strange man Tony bought them a couple three cans of wine at the store. When Anna met Jacob, they were both quite decent people and didn't drink that much. But genetics took their toll. Jacob's father was a heavy alcoholic. He caught almost all his scandals and quarrels with his mother. And one day he began to turn into that man. Anna, being an orphanage child, and therefore, having no family model in front of her eyes, began to degenerate as a person. At first she drank with her husband to get less drunk. Then she became addicted to alcohol. Having no higher education, they could not find a job that would suit them. And now every time one of them got a new job, not even a month passed before they were fired. So the family got used to living at the expense of the state, and especially kind relatives of the buddies would lend them money. One of such was Anna Lucy's sister. The woman worked as an accountant in a construction company and could afford to give her sister a few $100 a month to support her favorite nephews. Miranda began to frequent this noisy courtyard full of unusual personalities and noisy children. Sometimes she was on her way from the store, and sometimes she would just walk by, pictured there to sit and watch the summer's carefree bustle of kids. She walked around, yes, around inside her mind for a long time. But when once again she saw the shy blonde-haired girl, Kate and her friend knew for sure she wanted to see her. And it wasn't just a feeling of pity for the neglected child. It was something more. Wendy liked to go out on her little balcony on the third floor, where a cat with little purple flowers was tied up on ropes, and the wire was converted to a parapet by an ashtray that was a tin can of Sprat. From there she watched the life of the neighbors and just smoked. On one of those lazy days when there was no reason to go outside and just didn't feel like it, Wendy saw Miranda. She remembered that she had seen her before. She didn't like her presence in the yard. She doesn't talk to anyone. She's weird. What's the point of being here at all? The woman thought. Miranda sat on a bench. She didn't have any shopping to do this time. She seemed to have come here purposefully. Coming here, for the umpteenth time, she had never struck up a conversation with anyone. 
and to some she had already managed to be attracted. Miranda called out to Kate. She recognized the familiar face and, leaving Daria alone, ran up to Miranda. Oh, hello. Are you here again? The girl said with a childish, naive smile. I'm here a lot now. I come here maybe five times. I've already answered here. The new picture is familiar. Come in, you live nearby. Yes, I do. You haven't been around for a while, have you? Kate was shyly silent. Miranda realized that she had hurt the girl and hurried to reassure her. It doesn't matter. Well, not important. So the business was important. And who do you live with? Do you have a husband? Kate asked. No, I don't have a husband. And children? No kids either. Miranda gloomed a little, but not for long. Next to her, 20 centimeters away from her, sat a curious little beauty who was as interested in the life of her interlocutor as she was. Kate, you tell me, what do you do? Are you out with a friend? Miranda also already knew what the girl had to deal with every day and she wasn't even a little bit honest with her. This wasn't the fifth time she'd come here to the yard. She had been coming here for two whole months. The woman wanted to hear and see the noise and the fun, the child. And if other adults sometimes resented such an environment for Miranda, this yard was a fairy tale. Except for the hair, the girl with the big blue eyes was only the second time she'd seen it. Not much of anything. I don't know. Kate hesitated, twirling a strand of her blonde hair around her finger. Sometimes we run around the garages. Oh, don't tell anyone. She covered her mouth with her hands, glanced confusedly at the woman across the garages, barely concealing her indignation, and interjected Miranda. It's dangerous, Kate. My husband shouldn't, but Daria and I like it. But she's not allowed, the girl replied. And you? I'm allowed to do anything. The girl grinned so uncharacteristically ironically for her age. Miranda felt uncomfortable. She realized, of course, what poor Kate was getting at. After that conversation, these two different souls became even closer. Every time a woman came into the yard, Kate would throw herself around her neck screaming Miranda, and hugged her gently, asking about business. Miranda told her that she worked as a doctor in a private clinic, that she loved reading and traveling. Kate had never been farther than the nearest suburbs. She loved to listen to her new friend's stories about the pyramids of Egypt, the blue vast sea, and the big African elephant that dragged their fascinated passengers sitting in Hindi right on its own back. One such lively conversation Wendy overheard while standing on her favorite balcony with a cigarette. She realized that the girl's parents were probably in no condition to know about Kate's new friend and felt it her duty to steer the woman away from the naive child. She saw Miranda as evil. One day, Wendy decided to talk to her. Kate was no longer in the yard. Miranda sat alone and stared at the burning windows of the houses. It was getting dark. She leisurely approached the bench where the stranger was sitting and addressed her. Good evening. Hello, Miranda replied. Wendy immediately there seemed to be consternation and uncertainty in her voice. That feeling was even stronger. Reinforced her suspicions. Nothing good about this woman, she thought. Do you live here in these houses? Wendy asked, a little farther away. I like to vacation here. Do you like the screams of our children? Wendy laughed hostily, sat down on the bench next to Miranda and smoked. I like children, they don't annoy me, replied the stranger calmly. Especially Kate, do you like it? The abrupt switch from you to you seemed to Miranda to show some hostility on the part of the interlocutor. What do you want, woman? I'm just socializing with the kids. They come to me on their own. And, you know, times are tough. And you know what Kate, our kid, we're all watching her. And her parents are alcoholics. But we love that girl, and we're not gonna let her get hurt. I'm very happy for you. I don't know what you're getting at. Wendy was a fan of watching the news on TV on cold, cloudy days, when you did not want to go out, even to smoke on the balcony, often gained for his and hardships of the past, the heart and side pure. What is going on? At that time rare were news about pedophile maniacs, and people engaged in such black business as illegal transplantation, slavery and drug business. All of these puzzles in her mind had formed an unpleasant picture. 
She was now more worried than ever about the fate of abandoned children like Kate and Daria. Wendy did not question Miranda. She felt it was her duty to declare her attitude toward the local children who were deprived of care and control from their parents. Yet after the conversation she left the yard with mixed feelings. Or maybe really this woman was just a good-natured lover of children. But on the other hand, Wendy had seen a lot of things in her life and once came to the conclusion that there is always evil everywhere and in everything. And now she did not understand the true intentions of the stranger, but as if she felt that there was something hostile in these intentions. Friday evening. It was as if there was a general picnic in the city. There were those who, without going out of town, even to the park, celebrated the beginning of the long-awaited weekend in the hot days right in their yards. The guests of our yard were no exception. He bowed cheerful and already a little tipsy. The crowd was making it right on the urn. Not too long ago painted bright green. Even though the time was no longer childish, there were still little kids running around the yard. They were the children of the very people who were making kebabs, heatedly discussing the latest news in the country and in their own yard. Is she the one who sat down? That's how he sat down. That's how he sat down again. Nick, what is it? Nick, what do the children want? That's about the kind of talk that came to innocent cats, little children. But they, being busy swinging on swings, running around and playing criminals, did not get into all the details of adult affairs. They only nodded among themselves when they heard swear words from drunken uncles and aunts. Kate was among these children. Her parents were very fond of summer vacations in the yard. One of the reasons for their addiction to such pastime was the most common laziness and impotence. Jacob and Anna did not like to go out for long periods of time beyond the yard or the grocery store, where they could buy inexpensive and tested alcohol. By 11 o'clock p.m., all the adults, they noted Friday, in the yard were pretty drunk. Their children were still out for a walk. They sat down on a separate empty bench and whispered anxiously about something, peering at the drunken groups of people they knew. Instead of cooking kebabs, it was noisier than it had been an hour ago. If the kids were quiet, the adults were louder, and it wasn't just talking. The guys, it was realized, were conflicted. The more alcohol these people put into themselves, the more they became bolder, more determined, and most importantly, more aggressive. Jacob was the one who yelled the most. He was hurt by the words of his friends, and he got into a fight with his fists. His wife Anna wanted to calm him down, but she realized that she could hardly stand on her feet, and she just did not have the strength to enter into the conflict between the men. Fortunately, this stormy dispute did not end in a fight. Jacob hysterically waved at his buddies, and Anna and Kate still stood for a long time. Sitting on the bench figures, urging to go home in the hands of the drunken father of the family was half-empty bottle, and he barely held it. The family's entreaties had no effect on Jacob, and he barely got up from the bench and headed deep into the houses unknown where and why. The next day Kate was approached by a crowd of guys and girls about 12 or 13 years old. They smiled wryly and some had embarrassment on their faces. Kate, I think your dad's lying in the driveway. Told my wife, and the others giggled that she didn't. She said thoughtfully and sadly. Girl, yeah yeah, there's your daddy lying drunk. Somebody in the crowd shouted. Go look. Kate didn't go to the entrance of that house. She felt hurt and sad. It was shame for her own man. She was looked at and laughed at, jeered at, giggled at. And what was her fault? Toward her father she developed a grudge that day, but she didn't know what to do with that feeling. Kate had hoped for years that things would change for the better in their family. She wanted to stop one day seeing those endless bottles of cigarette butts everywhere in the apartment. Kate wished that Tim's brother would spend less time with boys on the street. Wished they could all go to the movies together. Thought sometimes she was small, of course. The shy girl never shared her worries with her family or anyone else. The most painful thing for her was to see a prosperous mother and father walking with their children, daughter, and son. She loved to observe such families closely, their habits, their gestures with a look. Somewhere subconsciously she tried to understand what was wrong with her family. It is difficult for an eight-year-old child to make complex conclusions 
and philosophize about the causes of certain events that occur in life. Therefore, without drawing any conclusions, Kate continued to live as normal children live, playing with friends, studying at school, and of course, dreaming. Two weeks passed. Miranda did not appear in the yard. Wendy was telling the local grandmothers about how they were taking her out of the yard. Kate was constantly disappointed, going all day in the yard and not meeting this mysterious Aunt Miranda, who, like a fairy godmother, came down to her from the fairy heavens. Only the girl got used to a new bright person in her life. How did this man disappear? For her, it was a betrayal. But one day she came lightly down on the bench, a skinny, tall woman in a long blue dress and with a bag in her hands, filled with groceries and exhaled heavily, as if she had been carrying heavy weights all day. Kate, seeing her from afar, rushed towards the bench. There was no limit to the child's delight. Miranda, shouted the girl and abruptly braked, lunged right at the woman. They embraced and began to share with each other the news of the past days. Wendy wasn't the only one. Many did not understand this strange friendship and considered the stranger, if not dangerous. For a girl, this is a very strange oddity. Miranda herself at first could not answer why she had formed a friendship with this little girl. But those thoughts of doubt were quickly transformed. A clear purpose. Kate was no longer so shy to talk about her feelings, about her attitude towards her parents, and how sometimes she had to be ashamed of them. She had long considered whether to tell her about the unpleasant event that had happened with her father, because she had never before wanted to bring out the dirt and be frank about her family. But now that she felt complete trust in Miranda, the language had unleashed itself. Miranda listened silently to Kate and asked her nothing for fear of hurting or offending her in any way. And at the same time, she was a very attentive interlocutor. Kate sometimes wondered how she could remember such details of her stories. Such interest of her new friend bought the girl up. Miranda, do you have a mother? Kate asked her. Sometimes, as is often the case with young children, she asked her companion the most sudden questions that stumped her. Yes, there is Kate. Why do you ask? No, I'm just asking. It happens. I just wanted to know. Miranda was curious in this girl, all even the most seemingly insignificant things were said by this woodland creature. Not for nothing. And the woman began to slowly consider meeting her as fate. It happened one hot July afternoon. First, Daria friend Kate, which was not at all peculiar to her, walked in the yard alone. Local grandmothers were surprised by such an event. Daria. Aunt Tanya called her, why are you walking alone? Kate, where? Kate wasn't here, I don't know. Finally, it got dark in the courtyard. Kate was gone. I wonder where Kate is. Do she and Daria walk together all the time? Wendy wondered. I don't know, replied Tanya. Still, I'm worried. Wendy went home to the AG's house. Her heart was not in the right place. They didn't open the door right away. Anna stood in the hallway, in a green robe with her hair shot up. The picture before Wendy was not the prettiest. Empty vodka bottles were lying everywhere. Jacob was lying on the bed, unconscious. She, where are the children? Wendy asked worriedly. I mean, I don't get it. Temka is in the room playing, sitting up, and the woman's petite face took on a completely different expression in an instant. She seemed to have remembered that she had a young daughter who didn't come home at 10 p.m. as usual. She's not in the yard, Anna. What yard? The time is 11 o'clock p.m., almost not anymore, she wasn't in the yard. For the first time in a long time, Kate's mother was in great anxiety. What to do now? Next rested her arms at her sides, walking over to the window. It happens so often with people that they think better as when the streetscapes appear before their eyes. She realized that by and large the girl's well-being was of interest only to her, and to some extent Anna even though the alcohol had destroyed almost her entire personality. It was necessary to help this woman, and more importantly to help Kate escape from trouble. The first thing that came to Wendy's mind was that the mysterious Miranda could harm the girl. Now it remained to figure out where to find this Miranda. No one knew where she lived. It was only known that it was somewhere nearby. Tim came out of his room. The boy looked out from behind him. 
He had probably just gotten out of bed and had absolutely no idea what the neighbor was doing here and why his mother was in such a state. Hello, Aunt Wendy. What's wrong? Mom, he looked questioningly at my mother. Kate's missing. Missing how? Well, she's an emergency. After saying that, Tim went to change his clothes. He must have thought that there might not be much time left, and then there was nothing to be done. So he decided to act at once. Two minutes later, the boy came out into the living room. He looked at his father lying on the bed. He was in a state. The loud talking had almost woken him up. He realized that it was about his daughter, but he also realized that he didn't feel like getting up to go out. And his excuse to himself was that he wouldn't. Tim looked at his mom and Aunt Wendy. They were the only ones in the whole world who felt real concern for the girl. The boy spoke firmly, we have to get out. In a minute, the three of them were outside and completely unsure of where to go. It was all her comrades. I was told that she was picking on her, Anna lamented. What kind of creature and about what? Asked the boy. Yes, Miranda is a woman. She and Daria and Kate socialize in the yard. What? What does she want with little children? Rascal bastard. I think I know who we're talking about. Me and the boys saw her the other day. She was going into a house with some kind of archway. I remember Tim. Yes, there's a reason you're wrong everywhere. Tim with a bitter smile full of worry said his mother, let's go there quickly. In the last 10 minutes, Anna had managed to sober up completely. Her perpetually detached look had changed to a look full of centeredness and desire to find her daughter. It was a brief rebirth into a real mother ready for the sake of her child to make any sacrifice. The three almost jawed to the very house where Miranda supposedly lived. Wendy and Anna knew an elderly woman from that driveway. Of course, she was already peacefully asleep at the time, but there was nothing to be done. A child's life was at stake. They called apartment number five. Adriana, open up please. You're crazy. Perverts. You can see the voice of an older lady approaching the door. Adriana, it's Wendy. Their daughter is missing. Wendy said impatiently. There was complete silence in the apartment. A moment later, there was a rustle and a heavy sigh from the landlady. She barely audibly muttered. All right, I'll open the door while the children are here. The door was opened by a short, skinny woman of about 75. Her face was hollow with traces of former beauty. Her gray hair was rather short, but her evenly trimmed bangs which adorned and ennobled her not young face, caught the eye. In appearance, she was good-natured and calm. But I that my darlings, I did not see your daughter. I rarely go out. Adriana answered. Do you know where Miranda lives? A woman in her fifties. She's been here a while. I think I asked her, but what is she? Is that what you're here for? I know, only she has nothing to do with it. And you're a grandma. How do you know? Anna started. The son hurried to calm down the nervous mother, who was on edge from the moment she learned about the disappearance of her daughter. Mom, stop it. It's not about that. Miranda lives one floor above me, but you don't touch her. She's here to help me and feed the kitties on the street. Adriana wanted to say something else, but her uninvited guests were already hurrying up to the third floor. Miranda opened the door almost immediately. Good evening. What can I do for you? Without a word, Anna, who stood in front of her, rudely pushed her into the corridor and walked briskly into the room. Miranda understood everything. She didn't resist or get in the way of these people. She understood. They had come looking for her favorite kitten. A few seconds later, Wendy and Tim entered as well. All three of them had been looking for the girl in Miranda's apartment, but saw that not only was she not here, but there was no sign of her. I may ask what or who you are looking for in my apartment, Miranda said, breaking the silence, the desperation of the girl's searchers. We were looking for my sister Kate. Sorry, we thought you had her. Tim replied sadly, how did Kate disappear? Not that. The woman was surprised. What do you know? Wendy replied sharply. Her attitude towards Miranda was still prejudiced. I've been in touch with the girl. She told me different stories. What did she tell you? You say we're going to lose her. Anna turned to the woman emotionally and with her hands on her head, slumped down on the blue couch that stood against the wall. Talking about some cars on sticks, 
She said she really wanted to go there but didn't know who to go with. Anna, Aunt Wendy, and Tim looked at each other. They all realized what kind of cars they were talking about. It was the local attraction near the Oriental Movie Theater. Almost running, they headed toward the place. Wendy, I beg you, go, go home panting, asked the woman Anna. She saw that Wendy was in no condition to move so fast. And yet she was making attempts, yes, auntie. Wendy, we'll find it ourselves now. Kate, we'll tell you everything at once. All right, fuck it, I'll go. Don't wait up. An elderly woman of 67 years old slowly changed from running to walking and sat down on a bench near the living house. Only found alive, she thought. There was both fear and pain on her heart for this child lost in every sense. Now there were two of them. The people closest to her were looking for Kate. They got to the rides that were about to close. Have you seen a girl around here? They approached the vacationers. Anna and her son began to describe her, but everyone was silent. Suddenly someone from a noisy group of young people. She asked. There was one. We don't know. There was a girl. Yours looked like they left about five minutes ago. She was with a man, like a man. Anna cried out. Which way did they go? Over there to those five-story buildings the young man pointed to the gray-paneled houses. Towering themselves among the other buildings, even more anxious mother and son ran towards the houses. They both knew. One of them had a dormitory run to this building. They rushed into the courtyard. Luckily, they saw Kate standing there with a suspicious man in his 30s. You bastard. Get away from my baby. I'll call the police, you bastard. Anna threw herself at the man and he ran away. Where are your eyes going? Tim was moving towards him, but the mother shouted Tim stop. The boy's boy won't catch up anyway. Let the bastard run. At home the unhappy Kate was waiting for a conversation with her mother, and already having smelled something wrong, conducted to her father. After half an hour of screaming at the girl, the parents left her and went to bed. The clock in the living room showed 13. The next day Kate did not leave the house. Miranda was worried about her. She sat in the yard for a long time, and then when she saw Aunt Wendy come into the yard, she immediately rushed over to her. Wendy, hello. I'm sorry, I'm very worried about Kate. What's wrong with her? Did you find her? Yeah, we found her all right. Wendy wasn't saying much. And where is she? There's Daria playing alone again. I don't know. What do you care about other people's little kids? Why are you talking to me like that? What right do you have? Miranda was indignant. I just don't understand why you want this girl. She is not your daughter, not your relative. You don't know her parents. What do you want? I know Kate. She's an eight-year-old girl, you're not her company. What do you want from her? Miranda kept repeating the same question. But Miranda didn't want to take on the role of a defendant trying to prove her innocence. Her parents are alcoholics. They almost lost the girl. What if I hadn't been there? Wendy remained silent. She realized that there was truth in the woman's words. Miranda continued, and I have grown to love this girl, and I worry about her. I see how hard it is for her. She doesn't even want to go home when it gets dark. You see all this and you say to yourself, they're other people's kids. You don't have to interfere, but I'm just talking to her. To you, her mother's drunken face and abusive father are the best thing for the girl. You're asking me what I want. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want me to stop talking to her? Would that make her life easier? I don't know. I sense danger in you. Kate just needs a friend. She needs someone who will listen to her and understand her. I never hurt her. But her own parents, they're monsters. They could be a danger to her, not her parents, not her mother. You have no right to discuss her. Why don't you take care of your own children? Wendy decided to talk about it not because she did not understand the elementary rules of ethics when she became acquainted with a person. You should not bring up serious topics without knowing anything about his fate. No, she asked the question because she wanted to expose Miranda. To understand what motivated her to communicate with Kate. It's my private life, I don't have to answer to anyone. All I'm saying is that Kate's in danger, I want to do something to help her. Both women were left with their own opinions and feelings after the conversation. But Miranda was more right that day than ever. In fact, her words became prophetic. 
Kate did not leave the house, and the next morning and evening, no one had seen her for over a week since she had met a man on the street near the yard, who was extremely dangerous to small children. She had met death itself, which she had managed to avoid thanks to a new friend named Miranda, Aunt Wendy, and her own mother and brother. But nothing good awaited the girl at home, and life had not changed for the better. In the morning, the father and mother were even angrier and more aggressive than at night. They had both sobered up. Anna told her husband about Kate's adventures in detail, and here was the intention to teach the daughter a lesson. These individuals did not want to think about the fact that their daughter was first of all a small, not thinking child who required attention, care, and most importantly, upbringing. They wanted to take out their anger and dissatisfaction with life on Kate. And that was that. Even the day before, having found herself in terrible trouble, having avoided it, the next day the girl got to the new parents, and having waited for the usual departure of the 14-year-old son from home beat the girl. Anna, of course, did not hit the child hard. She more shouted and controlled the actions of a scoundrel husband, who beat his own child with a belt and bare hands. After a while, the perverts realized that the girl had not risen from bed for a long time. On the pillow, they found traces of blood. Kate had to leave the hospital. She received serious beatings. The cruel parents worried not at all for her health, the girls as much as for the fact that they would have to answer for their actions to the doctors, and maybe even to the court. Before going to the hospital, of course, they had to come up with some sort of legend to explain such severe injuries on the little girl's face and body. The doctors in the emergency room looked at each other. They weren't just looking at the child. The appearance of her parents made them realize. The girl had been beaten by them. The young medic smiled at her colleague. It was, of course, a smile of irony. How many times had they encountered similar tales of a bad fall or a collision with a lamppost? Meanwhile, the nature of the injuries was obvious. It was a beautiful hot summer on July's cheerful, noisy days. Kate lay in a children's hospital on her bunk and looked out the window, dreaming of getting out of those gloomy, unpleasant four walls sooner. The only thing she was grateful for about this place was the temporary protection from her hated relatives. She missed her friend Daria, the other neighborhood children. Despite not having much contact with them, Kate was already starting to reminisce about school. She wanted to go to third grade. She also thought of her adult friend Miranda and wondered if she would be worried about her absence. She really cared about this stranger's feelings. She was no longer such a stranger to her. On the contrary, there was something native in her voice and in her smile. In spite of all the care the doctors had taken of little Kate at the time of her discharge, she was almost healthy, but she was not able to regain her original aesthetic appearance. Still on her face were bruises of the mortgage. But the girl did not worry about it. After all, ahead was a meeting with her dear and close people. After the home beating Kate began to appreciate the friendship with Daria and Miranda even more. She walked out into the courtyard. All eyes that day were directed toward her. And even though Kate was a little girl, everyone could feel her bruises and looked at her with special attention and interest. Hi, a friend hurried to hub the girl. Hi, Daria, I missed you. Oh, what's wrong with you? Did someone beat you up? I fell. You fell really hard. Yeah, yeah, Aunt Miranda asked about you a lot. She was worried. I know she was. That's okay, I'll see you soon. Daria asked about the details of the fall for a long time, of course, not realizing that she was hurting her friend and that she was being as inept and childish as she could, twisting and making up stories so uncomfortable and hurtful. Kate hadn't been in a long time. She caught herself in a complicated and unchildlike thought. I already have to lie to hide all these nightmares from others. And with that, she firmly decided I don't want to lie like this for the rest of my life. But as usual, she didn't know what to do to make her life, which was still just beginning, change for the better. Miranda was not in the yard that day. This circumstance upset Kate. Still, she was glad to be back in such a familiar and native place as the courtyard. At the same time, at the sight of the entryway of her own house, she grew gloomy and depressed. Even her feet were showing. And with all her body and soul she wanted to stay away from that place. 
which he was left in the yard. As always, almost the last one to arrive, she made her way to the entrance. She felt bad thoughts overpowering her. There was panic. Each step was given to the girl with heaviness. It was as if more and more shackles were being shackled to her feet. She stood by the front door for about five minutes and pondered. I don't want to go there. I really don't. I'd rather live on the street or, or at Aunt Miranda's. I don't want to live with them. I hate them. Why isn't Aunt Miranda my mom? It would be better for everyone. For the first time a thought occurred to the girl. It was so strange and yet logical. To live with Aunt Miranda. She did not want to impose on anyone and realized that her thought would not turn into reality. Meanwhile, tired long ago lonely and unhappy doctor gynecologist counseling pregnant and planned pregnancy women. Lying in her dark room on a soft couch, she stared up at a black dot on the ceiling. Her eyes were so focused as if she was contemplating her future life in that dot. In fact, she was. She liked to think, dream, fantasize. On a weekday after work, and as a rule, everyone had her even well mapped out. The available thoughts ended with painful digging herself and reminiscing about the mistakes of the past years. So she started with a vague future and ended with a heavy past, which now and then pressed an incomprehensible weight on her. Now, it was true, her habitual thoughts were often supplanted by thoughts of little but very brightness. Youngsters from the sun named Kate. She was alarmed at the sudden disappearance of the girl. Still, she was always glad to think of her and the innocent nonsense she loved so much. Their meeting took place almost two weeks after the next time they sought each other. Miranda, meeting the girl near their favorite shop, was both pleased and chagrined. But she did not question her about anything. Kate, as usual, started talking about her love of butterflies, about the bright star she had seen the day before in the sky about classmates, and about how she wanted to go to school and was thinking about how difficult it would be for her in third grade. Miranda, like the girl herself, acted like her little one's face. Her friends didn't change, even though it was difficult for her mentally. As Kate told her her next stories, she had conjectures, conclusions, and possible solutions. It was them. It was her inadequate parents. Swirling around in her mind were angry women. Only it was just like Kate's. She had no way out of this terrible situation, in which an innocent child suffered, and had long since chosen the streets of the neighborhood, in which dysfunction and danger reigned supreme. Always those girls snooping around. The locals were talking about Kate and Dasha. They didn't like it, and they understood the reasons for the girls' new wanderings on the street. But no one wanted or saw any point in doing anything to help them. And why should they? The kids had parents. And that meant that everything that could happen to the children was only on their conscience. What's fair then? The first person who really took an interest in Kate's plight was Miranda. She was lonely. Not long ago, her husband had left the woman. They'd been married for 20 years. It was a difficult decision for the two of them, especially Miranda. She loved Will. She gave him all the comforts of home, warmth, love, care. But most importantly, since some time for Will was to hear, finally, the cries of the baby you though beautifully furnished, but so quiet apartment. Miranda was 52. The last few years had been the most active for her in terms of having a baby. She had convinced herself and her husband that everything would work out, even though she was at such an inappropriate age for childbearing. A year ago, William turned 51. Do you realize it's a shame to have a baby at this age? What? ashamed. Miranda quietly, timidly, and at the same time with a slight note of complaint turned to her husband. So you're ashamed of me. Miranda, you're not. I'm just tired already. Of what? I'm 47. You're 51. We should just calm down, you know. All I know is that we can't give up. All the money that's been spent on this. Exactly, William said. What's the point? It's no use. This conversation was especially bitter for the women. They had been married for so many years. And now, after the hurtful words, the union had a good chance of falling apart after many years. William also worked in midwifery, and lately it had become hard for him to do this important business of delivering women. After all, his beloved had never given him a child. 
The decision to leave Miranda was not easy for him, but he did not make it overnight. Williams simply postponed it for another year. He loved her, but her prolonged and hopeless infertility sometimes frustrated him to such an extent that the only solution he saw was separation. Will felt himself growing colder to his wife, to her problems, to her successes, and even her joy when she smiled and laughed. All he did was squeeze a smile out of himself. 52-year-old gynecologist Miranda Feedy. Of course, she saw Lubomov's changes, but she didn't want to accept them. She let him go with the thoughts that he, like her, was tired of being devastated. At first Miranda supported the former spouse, calling I him and inquiring about his health mood. But things changed. In a moment she learned that her native beloved William will marry for the second time, and the chosen one was a young girl, a nurse named Kelly. Miranda knew her and I knew her. They often saw each other at the order of authorship. The girl was sweet and modest. She was pretty, but she was immature. Felt nothing for her but reveled in her youth. She had no idea that a certain non-verbal relationship had already developed between them, that little by little was destroying her already shaky marriage. Miranda later learned that Kelly was pregnant. She made a difficult decision for herself that day. She moved out of the neighborhood where she and Vidya had met and lived, where she had worked for over 10 years, and had been calling for a private perinatal clinic for a long time. And she, as if sensing that one day these people would be useful to her, did not refuse them, citing the impossibility of getting a job with them due to various difficulties. Miranda began to breathe hard again, and again stumbling over her ex-husband's personal life information. It became unbearable. William tried to avoid her so as not to hurt her feelings, but they worked in the same place. This meant that meetings, though rare, were inevitable. She moved to a disadvantaged neighborhood, but living there was geographically convenient for the weekday commute. Here she saw for the first time this little girl, who touched the most delicate strings of her soul. The thought of children never faded in her mind. She still wished to have a child and even planned to go to an orphanage. But the acquaintance and further nice kind conversations with Kate all had postponed that trip. She was already interested. There were other children. For her, as for other real moms, they were strangers' children. One had so imperceptibly and quickly become her own. Another already less tense conversation with Wendy seemed to gather all Miranda's thoughts into one decision. She didn't understand what she had heard from her neighbor, but she felt that she understood everything. Again you asked the approaching Miranda, holding the bags in her hands. Me again, you know I live nearby. Maybe I'm not allowed to sit in the neighbor's yard now. You start acting like you want to, just as weird as I am. All right, that's enough of that. Where do you go grocery shopping? You live online, and we all go to a 10 instead of a meeting. Well, I can go there too, she answered indifferently. Clearly, she was thinking about something else. I was not very concentrated on the conversation. There was silence between the women. A light summer breeze ruffled the blonde strands of hair that came out from under Marina's crab. She looked away toward the noisy roadway. Miranda, are you married? I'm not. And children? Miranda didn't answer. Wendy didn't bother asking her. She suddenly thought of her family of gays. And these alcoholics are our two children Tim and Kate is your favorite. But she herself is an orphanage, orphanage. Miranda asked thoughtfully. What a wedding we had here. We partied all night. They went to a restaurant. It was such a PR, I don't know where he found her. And then the bottle. And that was it. There's a lot of people like that around here. It's just the most scandalous ones. Miranda eagerly caught every word from Aunt Wendy, looking for salvation and a way out of the situation. And when she got home with bags full of food and lay down on her blue couch, she began to have intrusive thoughts. Not an alcoholic. The orphanage, so Kate doesn't know her grandmother. So what? Why are you telling yourself all this? No, what's the big deal? It's August. The kids were starting to feel a little bit more like school was approaching. Some were anxious, some were excited. And there were those who were especially pragmatic, who thought that it would be good to use the last summer money to the fullest, without thinking about the future. 
but as it got significantly colder outside. Neighbors smoking on the balcony was no longer observed. In the yard such a noisy large crowd of children became noticeably quieter and calmer. It was a quiet, calm and cool day. Kate went outside in a light pale green jacket. Daria was not in the street. She was walking alone, daydreaming about something, and occasionally daring to step into a sprint. Her mind was whirling merrily, swapping one for another. Childish, funny, ridiculous, and just plain fun thoughts. Miranda came later. She called out to the girl. Kate. Hi. How are you doing? Miranda, hi. I'm good. How are you? She walked over to her friend and saw that she looked puzzled about something. Miranda had been really thoughtful since morning and afternoon at work. And now that she'd met Kate. Miranda, you look sad, the kid said. I was just thinking, my good ones. About what? About you, Kate. I think about you a lot now about me. What's there to think about me about? After a moment, the woman said uncertainly. How are you like me? Yes. Do you like star butterflies too? The girl smiled, no, my girl, you and I are alike in more ways than just that. You're my kin, you're my kin. Kate didn't understand what Miranda was getting at. Miranda was silent. She was uncomfortable with something she had already considered several times, something that had been long ago decided by her. Now it was so hard to voice to this trusting little angel. So reluctant to deceive her. I am your grandmother. Quietly, she said, but it can't be loud. Having said these words, the girl took a deep breath and covered her mouth with her palms. I don't have a grandmother. I don't have a mom. She's from the orphanage. I know Kate, your mom, was taken away from me a long time ago. And now I found you, Tim. You have your daughter. Your mom upset me. I don't want to know anything about her. She's hurting you. So mom doesn't know about you, but you know everything now. Miranda wanted to make one very important unexpected suggestion to the girl, but restrained herself, thinking that today she had enough information, which was not only shocking, but also false. This woman had suffered much in her life. It was a long time for him, in spite of his efforts and righteous living, to face the fact that she could not once again have a child. A small and sharp blow was the betrayal of her husband. Of course, all these events had affected Miranda, and she was no longer the same. The moral boundaries within her were erased. It seemed that she was ready for the most any stupid, rash, and terrible step. She thought long and hard about the neglected blue-eyed girl named Kate. And finally, she had made up her mind. She was going to steal her away from her family. Miranda was at the stage of thinking out her course of action. She had no margin for error. A mistake meant a complete failure in life closing the last door to at least this late personal happiness. That in her case meant imprisonment. Miranda realized if she was caught, she would not survive the shame and imprisonment. Careful and cautious, the dweller of the house with the arch was not only watching Kate. She already knew quite a bit about her parents, her brother, those who might have caused the threat. One of them was Aunt Wendy. Miranda learned that the grief her parents had found as of late had been in a terrible drunkenness and had seen and understood little of the world. Those we came home less and less often. Rumors that Anna and Jacob were in an inadequate state spread from bench to bench, from yard to yard with the speed of the first August leaves falling to the ground. Everyone knew the couple hadn't left the house in weeks, unless it was to replenish their supply of alcohol, which at the time was vital to them. The day of the false confession, Miranda was still a little doubtful about the correctness of her action and further plans. She sat at home in the semi-darkness and pondered. But for each of her inner questions, she found the answer that was the justification she so desperately needed. That night she was like Raskolnikov, dividing people into the creature or the entitled. Miranda wondered to herself, why am I afraid to put the girl out of her misery? Does she really have the right to have and raise children? Where is the justice? As time went on, the questions became fewer and fewer, and in their place were now mostly statements that Miranda, of course, thought were correct. Alcoholics aren't human. Kate has a right to be happy, and I will make her happy. Why have I been tormented all my life? Why is it fate that I don't have children? I've done everything for this. Will I not be rewarded for it and have an outlet? 
Miranda interrupted her heavy meditations, crying. She became unbearable, sad and afraid. She feared for herself in case of failure. She feared for the girl in case something inside her did flinch. And she put it like that. But she lost her tears and looked at the homemade bracelets made of small colorful glass balls that Kate had given her the day before. I'm still going to save this girl by all means. They met again. Kate knew where her adult friend lived. And Miranda invited her over. It was early weekend morning, about 8 o'clock or a little earlier. That way the risk of being seen by the locals was reduced many times over. Miranda was afraid that Kate would not want to go far away for a long time and with a stranger from her family. She loved Tema, though she rarely saw her. She loved the place she lived in. She also loved the school and the teachers. Thoughts of the girl's possible disagreement were now perhaps the only obstacle to her goal. Miranda looked at Kate seagally, hers practically gone. The girl had been surprisingly cheerful and alert that day, but that she didn't tell anyone anything like I asked Kate to. What's wrong with you? No? In a whisper, Kate said. Kate, I have a serious conversation to have with you. Just please think yourself well. The girl looked intently at Miranda. Kate, I want us to go away, go to my place. This place outside the city forever, asked the girl. She was even more surprised and confused than when she had heard that the mysterious woman turned out to be a grandmother. This question was one of those that Miranda had not thought through at all. What was the best answer? To lie again or to tell it like it was. She didn't want to lie to the girl again after that big deception, but her reaction scared her. Kate was terrified, and in her eyes she could read it. A sudden sadness came over her. She was a child after all, and her parents, no matter how they sometimes showed themselves, were her family. And most importantly, she loved her brother Tim. Not for a year, or maybe two, I want to, and then we'll come over. What will mom and dad say? I mean, they'll fight. I've talked it over with them. Unfortunately, there's no time for goodbyes. If we don't leave, we'll never leave now. A decision. The girl laughed for a long time and looked at the floor. Occasionally, she glanced at Miranda and the latter just stared at the unfortunate child whose life could change abruptly in a moment. And what was wildest of all, she had to decide her fate here and now. Okay, we'll go, I've decided. Miranda exhaled deeply and trying to hide her extreme satisfaction from the psychological work done. The woman already had everything ready. Clothes, warm summer shoes, hygiene products, books, skew to the road. All this fit into a dense bag and a large backpack. Miranda did not want to attract unnecessary attention with a big bulky suitcase. Her task was to leave the city limits with her child as discreetly as possible. They boarded a bus first, then another, then a third. That too was part of the precaution. But on the bus there was no need to show identification. After all, it was dangerous to leave any traces in the form of information about themselves. Miranda had distant relatives she had visited when she was young. It was a village far from the city. Not abandoned, but dying out. Mostly old people lived there. And life there had a slower and more measured pace. No one quarreled, no one fought. People went about their daily lives and went to the store five kilometers away. They talked to each other on the benches. And sometimes they just admired the view from the window. They watched the birds of the sunset from the branches of the trees. If someone was in the habit of coming here every 10 years, that person would not notice that something was changing. Even the villagers appeared the same. After decades, there was a magic to this place. The townspeople called the village by the humble name of Bull's Bermuda Triangle. Kate, to the delight of her new grandmother, had been like a child in her first days in the village, neither picky nor fussy. The environment was calm and quiet, but it was quite difficult for an eight-year-old girl to change her routine. Miranda drew water for the two of them from a well. Washing had to be done in a narrow wooden house with a wooden floor. On a stand lay an old mill. There was a bar of white soap stuck to it, which had already turned to stone, making it impossible to wash properly. Fortunately, Miranda had all the necessary hygiene products with her. She loved wood to heat the house. It was a most amusing sight for Urban Kate. She'd seen wood chopping, of course, but only on TV. 
and they were all strong, sturdy men. And here the grandmother herself was engaged in such unladylike labor. After a couple of days of living in the cabin, which was, by the way, despite all the inconveniences, quite cozy for living in it, Miranda and Kate had a conversation. The woman wanted to secure herself and her once more from the people who would certainly be looking for them. Glasses of delicious trophy tea were left on the table. Kate returned to the house after a hike to a nearby grove. But what found mushrooms only one girl sadly showed her grandmother. Do not worry, come fall. We'll go with you to the forest full of them to pick them. Kate sat down at the table. She took a glass in her hands and began to give up steam, going to the hot trophy tea, inhaling with her nostrils. His beautiful forest scent. Miranda looked at the girl and thought about the fact that she was still in danger. What if people came? What if word of the girl's disappearance was already going around the country? She remembered that look of instant sobering and a mother ready to kill her Kate when she came to her in that one. What was she capable of? She didn't know. One had to be reassured. No matter how calm and detached the inhabitants were, anything could happen. Kate, I have something to ask you. Miranda said shyly. Kate had already drunk tea and started on the cookies. Aha, uh -huh. the girl replied nonchalantly. You could call me mom. Kate could not answer this question immediately. A week ago, the person sitting across from her was just Miranda. A few days ago, her own grandmother, and now she was asking for something more difficult for a young child to understand. I know it's difficult, but it's necessary. But I have a mom. Miranda did not coax the girl. She decided that she herself would indirectly encourage Kate to do so. Now she addressed her not only as Kate, but also as daughter. She looked quite young for her 52 years and afterward. Kate, it was so wild for me one day to still address her as mom. Kate's appearance also underwent a change. Long hair going all the way down to her elbows. Hers was now short and the ends barely touched her shoulders. Meanwhile, while Kate and Miranda, drinking tea in the village cottage, heated by the seal of the couple and only noticed that the daughter disappeared from the house and did not appear for more than three days. To make such a conclusion, they were helped by Tim. The boy, too, had been leaning here and there with his friends all this time. And it so happened that he just ran from the hallway to his room or slept there and also quickly removed in the morning to the street. The boy was exposed to the influence of drinking company. There were 16-year-olds among them, and they all knew about beer, vodka, and cognacs firsthand. Tim got bored, just hanging around the streets of the neighborhood. So he joined the older guys. Now his summer everyday life consisted of fun drinking with grown-up guys and girls, mopeds, and alcohol. Theme. All these three days felt something wrong, but could not understand what was wrong. She was living her own life, where there was almost no room for family. And although he loved Kate, but for a while he forgot about her that day when he decided to relax at home longer and play an online game with friends. The older brother remembered that his little sister didn't annoy him like before, didn't ask him about anything, and didn't ask to sit at the computer. He didn't see her in the yard when he came home. Tim went into his parents' room. They were both in the mid-afternoon state. Mom, Dad, where's Kate? Anna got up on the bed and held out her palm from behind the back of her eye. Kate, Jacob, Jacob, have you seen Kate today? The man, awake, still didn't understand what the housemates wanted him to do. Kate, Kate, gone. Don't you understand? His wife yelled at him. What do you mean she's gone? She's not missing. She's walking around the yards. From despair and indifference, Jacob, she slowly sank into the chair and grabbed her head with her hands. What a nightmare. Kate, she cried for the first time for her daughter, rather than risk never seeing the girl again, and something told her that now there would be no happy ending. Just as it had been when they had searched for Kate with Tim and Wendy. The day they realized Kate was missing, the neighborhood police were called in. And the very next day, the whole town was looking for the little girl, on almost every post and on every bulletin board in the city hung a black and white portrait of Kate, a beautiful blue-eyed girl with a kind smile and gorgeous, long, blonde mustache hair. The case of missing eight-year-old Kate quickly spread across the country. 
every region was involved in the search for the missing girl to a greater or lesser extent. Of course, when visiting the police station, they never forgot to mention a certain Miranda, who had lived in a neighboring house for some time and was friends with Kate. She's the one who stole the girl. I know for sure, we should look for her, said the desperate women. But it turned out that Miranda was living in the apartment illegally, and no documents were provided to the landlord. A second case arose, and the police took up the search for the owner of the apartment. All these problems were even more waiting to get on the trail of the kidnapper. It turned out that no one could say anything about this woman. Especially the police did not want to develop a man who was not seen for anything criminal. Except for socializing with a little girl. It wasn't clear to anyone, including the investigators. They sat in a small stuffy office with old furniture and already retired from modern technology computer, turning on everything once in a while and discussed cases. There were two of them, a young investigator Andrew and a senior police lieutenant Michael. But that's what it wants from us, angry as a cattle. It's her own fault that the girl is missing. But you can see from her face that she was beating her. Come on, Michael. We got a kid to find. Who we got in the pipeline? No one. You remember what that broad said about that sketchy janitor who left with the girl? I think that's him. And Miranda is some kind of fairy tale creature. Basically, if we work hard enough, we'll find her. We can do a sketch based on the mother's description, canvas the neighborhood. Andrew, let's not do that yet. We'll look for this asshole for now. And the aunt is for just talking to the little one now. Do we have to bring everybody up? It seems to me that after these two words, Andrew became silent, which could have cost him the revelations that he was suddenly so eager to express. What do you think? It seems to me that if they were looking for the daughter of some local oligarch, they'd find Miranda, this one and anyone else. Andrew's still young. Senior Lieutenant Michael's conclusion was completely inappropriate and ill-considered. It carried no hidden meaning except that Andrew was really physiologically young. With such phrases, the chief subdued the ardor of energetic employees who, as he believed, had not yet known real life. So the investigators agreed that Miranda should be excluded from the suspects, especially since the investigation had no information about her. Miranda. Having been alive for a month now, Kate never lost her guard. When she came to town for a necessary occupation, she came across a photograph with a familiar face on one of the lampposts. It was Kate. The woman became uneasy. She found the nearest bench and sat on it. But here I am, a criminal. I've stolen someone else's child. But how unfair is life? Miranda in general lately more and more agreed with that inner self, which once pushed her to deceive Kate, and later to kidnap her. She played the role of savior, sincerely not understanding, and not accepting the outside world and people around. All people seemed to her not decent, evil and worthy only of punishment and retribution. And she also fell in love with the word fate. Everything that happened to her and her Kate, she called this word. But none of it was a dialogue with her friends or co-workers. It was a dialogue with herself. Talking to Miranda was not something she was afraid to do with anyone. Getting unnecessarily caught up with people in whom she saw only hostility. The town Miranda traveled to was small. The local police knew about the village but they did not disturb this small world cut off from civilization. We won't stick anything in the village. There is nothing there to scare the locals with all sorts of passions, the head of the department told her charges. Three months passed. The cold November has come. Nature had seen to rise one day after a long wait and reward all living things with the sharp colors and fragrant smells of spring. Tim was on his way back from school. He was no longer part of the company of those murderous boys. Interacting with them had fatally, he believed, affected his life and the lives of his family. He walked down the dark corners of the streets, and his heart could not with the pain of the darkness remembered his sister again. How little time I spent with her. I should have been watching her and helping her. I hate you. The boy had never been fond of his parents. But now he would come home to lock himself in his room until morning and head off to school again. A strange feeling attended the boys. It was as if Kate had ceased to exist for him. He still hoped that she would show up one day, but that hope was fading with each passing day. 
He walked into the hallway. The apartment was quiet. Street concerts, squabbles, and shouts carried from the neighboring courtyard. It had been a long time since the neighbors had been heard. And in general, they were less and less mentioned by the locals. Only the grandmothers, when they saw the gloomy Anna walking towards the wine store, murmured among themselves, discussing the woman's hard fate. What a pity for her, they said. Only Wendy did not consider this character a victim. She was the only one who seemed to know something and was never embarrassed at the sight of Kate's mother walking down the street. While the child was being searched for all over the city and people around her were discussing this horrifying event. She was calm. The subject is you a muffled voice came from the kitchen. It was mom. Tim didn't answer anything and headed towards his room. Tim called out to his mother even more quietly. The boy reluctantly walked into the kitchen. He saw a pathetic creature that very roughly resembled a woman. Anna's face had grown coarser and was covered with numerous wrinkles and puffy. Her hair, as usual, had an unwashed and unkept look. She smelled like she hadn't showered in a week. Maybe she hadn't. I haven't heard anything, nothing new. Do you think she'll be back? I don't know, exhaled the subject to the press. Tim sat down opposite. There was an ashtray on the table. One of the bulls was also downing his only cigarette. The boy saw a tear on his mother's cheek. She rested her fist and her forehead and sobs looked at the floor. The picture is my daughter. The subject was in a state of stupor. He and pitied his mother, but the feeling did not leave him. The boy realized that all these tears and worries were the payment for leaving them once, leaving the one who needed them all. Even though he saw in his mother a kind of rebirth, it had even pleasantly surprised him at one point. But the thought of Kate being gone, with them, brought him back to a harsh reality where there was no room for any positivity. Still, he instinctively got up from his chair and walked over to Tim's mother, put his arms around her and whispered, It's not your fault. Don't torture yourself. I love you. November replaced December, and later winter replaced spring. It was especially painful for Kate's family to spend time in the backyard of the house, the very noisy realm of children where Kate loved to spend time both Tim and his parents. After several times visiting the palace, they decided not to go there anymore and began to avoid the place. But time moved inexorably on and on, turning fresh wounds into scars and fresh memories into emptiness. Kate grew up and well. When she turned 15, it wasn't enough to have her mother's books and an old TV with two channels, the girl had no friends and no phone. She was a real schoolgirl. And if her mother wasn't around, she would go feral. Miranda became sick more often. The woman was 61 years old. Her only help and doctor was her daughter Kate. She left inside her this fear for her beloved and only being on earth, and in seven years never made friends or even acquaintances. And if Kate was enough for her and replaced her friend, companion, assistant, and psychologist, the young, beautiful girl was just hungry for new acquaintances and a new modern comfortable life. Miranda let her go to town more and more often, but asked her to be quiet cautious and not to contact anyone. The girl spent her time at the movies and cafes and shopping malls. Fortunately, her mother was able to give her money for such entertainment, who threw quite a decent amount of money on her account every month. And she also wrote scientific papers and articles to order. One day it all happened. Kate made a friend a guy named Alex, he was urban and a little older than her. Kate told her mother that she was going for a walk around the city alone, but she was in the company of a nice young man. When Alex found out that her friend didn't have a phone, he briefly bought her one as a gift as a token of friendship. When the mother found out such careless purchases, she became displeased almost escalating into rage. Kate, we agreed no cell phones. She was indignant, but I'm an adult. Look, I have a different outlook on life. And what are yours? Tell me, tell me, Rhonda asked in a mocking tone. I think you can't hide from people. I don't understand why we've been doing this for so many years. I've explained it to you. We are being chased by people, dangerous people. By the way, Miranda had said a lot of things to Kate in those seven years. A lot of things, often things that had nothing to do with reality. Once you deceive someone, it's easier to deceive them again. 
so there's a whole chain of lies being built up. Before Miranda knew it, this style of communicating with her daughter had become habitual. Here Kate, too, became dishonest and mature with her. She asked herself questions to which she could not find answers. And slowly it became clear to her. Miranda had been deceiving her for a long time. Lately, the girl had even become annoyed by her excessive concern for her. Constant warnings and advice that sounded like orders. Phrases I'm worried about you. You're my only family, and I wish you nothing but good things. Being always comforting, we kindly began to push her away. Dangerous people. What kind of people are these? Maybe you mean your daughter? Which daughter Miranda, upon asking Kate about it, immediately realized that Kate meant her alcoholic mother. And she was quick to correct herself. Anna, I was starting to forget that she was my daughter. This conversation had been on her mind for a long time. She did not understand how you could love your granddaughter and forget that you have a daughter. She now had even more distrust for the man she was living with. This whole picture of life was no longer comfortable and familiar to her. Kate, like a bird, wanted to jump out of this not at all golden cage and smell somewhere far away. More and more often she imagined her father, her brother and her mother Kate missed them. Kate began to see Alex more and more often. She was also taking English classes now. And she was both scared and pleased to finally feel socialized. Where there were people her age, young female students, college students, and professors everywhere, who were all educated, interesting individuals. She finally had the opportunity to socialize and came to this decision on her own. Kate was cramped in a village where the most interesting entertainment was watching an old TV with two barely working channels. They met after the course and went outside to the park. They were out in the springtime. Beautiful people were watching the most lush blooming of nature. It was the beginning of May. Alex had heard some things about Miranda already and didn't always understand his and Kate's relationship. He was interested in his girlfriend's life and one day decided to have a serious conversation with her. Kate, I got that right. She's not your birth mother. She's my grandmother. She once asked me to call her mom. I did. Don't you miss yours? I do. But if I leave too, she can't stand it. She once said if I left, I shouldn't come back. Kate, it's all manipulation. You have to realize that. What does that mean? Kate read science fiction, of course, but the versatility of her communication was sometimes lacking. She didn't know many modern phrases, fashion trends. Alex was a savior for her in this world. Everything that seemed strange to the girl. For example, when watching a movie, she would check with her friend. That means, Kate, she controls your emotions, she knows you feel sorry for her and pressures you to do so. Yes, that's true. But what do we do? Do you want to see your family? I want to see my brother. I don't know if I want to see the people who ruined my childhood. Grandma, she saved me from them. But she stole you. This sudden conclusion Alex kind of shook Kate's mind. She thought for the first time that Miranda's act could, in fact, be considered kidnapping. Stolen, but she said it was best for me. I was beaten, Alex. They drank. They were never interested. I understand. But you understand, too. She had no right to do that to these people. Kate that day was the first time she thought so deeply about the possible feelings of her first family. What if they're still hurting? What if they're looking for me? What if Grandma hadn't discussed anything with them? Alex's words were now unsettling. And it seemed he was right. Kate was determined to get her way. But how to make sure that her grandmother, to whom she owed a lot, would not be offended? One beautiful May evening they had a conversation. Did Kate spend a long time going round and round? Yes, around, talking about how much she would like to see her brother Tim, but saw that her grandmother was not very willing to talk about relatives. I've been meaning to ask you for a long time, why didn't you take the subject with us? He's your grandson too. He was a big boy, he wouldn't have gone. I talked to him, he made his decision. But why would you want to take away my ability to communicate with him? Kate, this is hard for me to talk about. Miranda realized that Kate was backing her into a corner with this kind of questioning. What was she to say about a teenage boy she had only seen a couple times? The woman's lies were amplified. The girl's curiosity grew more and more sophisticated. I want to go to them, 
Alka decisively, Kate cut Kate off. No, that's not even up for discussion. You and I have talked about it. Won't you take me back? If I come, are you going to kick me out? No, 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 emotionally shouted the woman. After a moment of calming down and catching her breath, she answered much quieter than before, as if to close the subject of all the girls' long-standing requests and complaints. They're dead, all of them. That it couldn't be. Kate didn't get up from her chair, but it is. Miranda, sitting on the chair in front of the dining table, rested her face in the palms of her hands. She wasn't crying, she wasn't hiding her tears, as people who want their emotions not to be seen by those around them usually do. She was hiding the absence of tears, she was hiding the shame of another lie. Another ten years passed, Kate was twenty-five. At this age, she had to experience another of the most bitter losses of her life. Her own beloved grandmother had died, though she was personally surrounded by more and more secrets with each passing year. Kate loved her sometimes strange, sometimes cruel, a very loving and caring grandmother Miranda. By this time the girl had already had a serious relationship with Alexei, the very guy who often spurred her to assert her rights in communication with her grandmother. As cynical as it may sound, but only after the death of Miranda Kate decided to take the step that her beloved had been waiting for her for five whole years. She told him yes, and it was two days after the funeral. Miranda still towards the end of her life accepted LX, because she realized the girl would need care and support. After all, except for her real grandmother and a young man, she had no one in this world. At least she convinced her of that. Kate, coming to the native cozy little house where she grew up and comprehended life through books. Communicating with her grandmother Miranda was happy and sad. She realized I was entering a new life, but something seemed to put her down. And it wasn't just the death of a dear and close person. Kate felt that the death of her grandmother did not close all her spiritual worries and eternal state of anxiety. Her heart was still out of place. Both mind and body had been calling to Kate always since the day of Miranda's death. And here she was, surrounded by objects and furniture that had once been so familiar to her, she had learned the roughness in the holes and birthmarks of each. Strangely, the girl caught herself thinking that she had never laid or even sat on her grandmother's bed. She slowly walked over to it and sat down on it. That dark green bedspread that her grandmother used to cover her bed with. That red patterned rug that always gave the house, a special atmosphere and coziness so cheerful in the apartment. Those intricate figures on the carpet always brought the girl back to the past. Kate threw her head back and cried. She was to be married soon. But for some reason doubts were creeping into her soul. The girl didn't want to start a new page of life, not having sorted out the old ones yet. A lot of questions hung in her soul. What happened to her relatives? Why had her grandmother taken her so far away, and why was she only worried about her? By the way, wanted answers to all these questions. And those answers came. When she calmed down and wiped her tears away with her hand, she turned to the wall and saw something white between us. It was deeply hidden. And yet, as if on purpose, part of it was peeking through the gap. Kate tried to get it out, but failed. Then she found a pair of scissors in her grandmother's old jewelry box. The name she grasped the edge and pulled out the whole thing. It was a piece of paper folded in four. Having discovered an interesting find, the girl hurried with it to the light. She sat down by the window and unfolded the sheet. Kate immediately recognized the familiar handwriting. It was Miranda's grandmother's. Her hands were covered with cold, sweat, and even trembled slightly. She didn't know the contents of the letter, of course, and couldn't even guess what it would say but for some reason she felt that her life would change drastically after reading it. Kate read the following lines. Dear Kate, you know and see how sick I am. Every day could be my last. I try to see you more often, to see your smile and how happy you are. Yes, I want to tell you again, taking your Alex, there is so much I want to tell you right now, but unfortunately I am. Pathetic and cowardly. I only ask you for one thing. Let this be my last will and testament. Not, 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 cursing me for what I'm about to tell you now. I'm not your grandmother, I'm not your mother, I'm nothing to you. But I loved you very much when I saw you on the playground. You were an angel to me then, and I'm an unhappy man. 
an unhappy woman who met betrayal, deceit, and pain along the way. I could never have children. The man I loved left me. And he and I lived together for 20 years. You appeared to me just at the moment when the darkness in my soul closed everything alive. I'm grateful for that, but I've been lying to you all this time. I saw how worried you were about your family. I know who left you with those bruises on your face and your body. And I so didn't want them to do it again. My heart is breaking with pain. I'm a liar. I stole you, I kidnapped you. They were looking for you, they were all looking for you, Kate. I know that. But the scariest, most important thing I lied about is that your brother, your mother and father, they're alive. Yes, they're alive, they're still living in Chicago. If you've forgiven them and go there soon. Being a mother is the greatest value in life. I've experienced it because of you. Kate sat on the bed for a few minutes in a state of complete stupor. She didn't believe the words that were written on the piece of paper. She didn't want to believe that her grandmother had cruelly deceived her all these years. And at the same time, it was as if she had learned what she had longed to know, and all the secrets that had kept her in suspense were revealed. She in general got what she wanted and now she was ready, probably to burn this message and erase in herself all memory to kill all desire to know the truth. The girl did not cry, which seemed strange to her. She tried to squeeze a single tear out of herself, but failed. Now her mind was dominated by the thought of going to her relatives. Three days after the bitter discovery and the gap between the betrayed walls, she finally made up her mind. Kate had packed her backpack, had already written Alex a message Alex. My family is alive. I'm going away. I'll be there in a few days or weeks. I'll explain everything. I'll tell you later. Kate sat at the small table in the kitchen where she had once had tea with her grandmother. She had decided that for the rest of her life, Miranda would be remembered as her own person. The resentment toward her lasted for a few hours, and later all that remained was pity. She took a seat on the path her things were already waiting for her in the hallway. The girl looked out the unwashed window at the courtyard. It would seem that she had waited so long for this moment. She had despaired so much when she learned of the death of her loved ones, and even regretted holding blackness in her heart for her mother and father. She had been so uplifted when she realized they were all alive, but something seemed to stop her from making this trip. It was hard for her to say, too. There's nothing you can do about it. When feelings bloom inside you, bad or good or. But they're all so ingrained in your head that every day, from waking up to falling asleep, you hear them, feel them, live with them, and a similar strong feeling came over Kate. She couldn't figure out what it was, fear or resentment or rejection. But it was strong behind the sea of energy, of feeling. She thought, whatever the deception was, everything that happened to me, from the moment I was kidnapped and moved away, led me to what is happening to me today. She was happy with Alex. Her soul and mind remained pure and not corrupted from city life. She looked at her watch. She had already missed the first bus of its kind.